Welcome back to the NWR Virtual Investor Conference Series 11. I'm your host today, Banjo Blake, and next up we have Silk Logistics. Silk Logistics supplies port logistics, warehousing and distribution services for FMCG, retail, light industrial, food and dairy sectors. Silk has established itself across the nation as a key player in the port logistics sector. From Silk today, we have Managing Director Brennan Boyd providing a presentation on the company. Thanks for joining us today, Brennan, and over to you when you're ready. Good afternoon, all, and uh, thank you, Banjo, for the opportunity uh, to yourself and NWR. Um, good afternoon, uh, Logistics. Um, we're in the very fortunate position at Silk to really find ourselves uh, at a bit of an intersection of, of what we think are really four key themes and trends. Uh, for those that are familiar with our prospectus document from last July, we call down in that the, the increasing propensity uh, for the outsourcing of logistics services. And indeed the recent uh, experiences through COVID have only quickened uh, the adoption of outsourcing as a solution for some of those supply chain challenges uh, customers have been facing. The second key thematic for us is we are an island nation, they'll be at a very large one. Um, but in the five major ports in this country, there's well over 9 million containers that arrive. And uh, the growth in that containerized freight will continue to outstrip GDP. And given our focus on our port logistics operations as a key part of our service line, uh, we think that positions us well. The other critical uh, theme, thanks, Banjo, before we jump into some of this, is uh, COVID has really reinforced the absolute need for analytics, information and visibility for customers to manage their supply chains. And we at Silk like to think that we're at the forefront of our service offer, not, with, not just with the physical distribution that you see uh, in this particular slide from port to door, but with our control tower platform, which addresses some of those requirements customers have uh, to manage their supply chains in, in this day and age. The last real trend, particularly out of the last two years, uh, for somewhat of a laggard in e-commerce, Australia is catching up quickly. And there has been significant growth in e-commerce through the COVID period. And with our recent acquisition of 101, we think we're positioning ourselves well to take advantage of that trend that's emerging in the logistics business. As you can see here from the slide in front of you, we provide that physical port to door service. But as I've just described, the critical overlay for us is our technology platform headlined by a control tower capability that really allows us to manage uh, the supply chain challenges our customers face. Just in terms of some of the quick history for the business, uh, 2014, John Sutter myself led a management buyout from Gresham of some distressed assets at that point. Uh, there's been a number of shareholder changes through the journey, culminating in the IPO last year uh, with a capital raise of 70 mil. The principal uh, driver of that was a shareholder who was wishing to monetize their share after a five year journey in the, in the business. And that was really the key driver along with opening up alternate sources of capital for us to continue our uh, M&A growth strategy. Um, thanks. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, whilst investors would be familiar with some of the uh, logistics style uh, aspects of our business. I think the critical piece that makes us unique is, is that tech enabled service offer allows us to embed ourselves in our customers and really achieve very strong growth. <coughs> Excuse me. Across our blue chip clients who are in the main long standing, 8.3 years, as you can see. Uh, with a real ability to drive a wedge into those customers through expanding our service lines and capturing 
their share of wallet spend. And that fundamentally outlines what we're trying to achieve with our business model. Um, we have termed the Biddle business and asset right model. What does that mean? We invest in IT as a critical enabler and point of difference in the market. And we also invest in specialised equipment. Um, if it's not a specific and specialised requirement, we will generally adopt a variable cost operation to that particular piece of the business. Example, uh, our scale trailers, which are effectively a commodity, we rent those on a day-by-day -day basis. We scale up when, when volumes are high. We turn that cost off when volumes are low. And that really gives us, uh, with that example, what we call our variable cost model, what we call asset right. It gives us the operational flexibility and allows us to optimise our capital, generating what we think are our industry-leading returns uh, in terms of return on capital, which currently is well in excess of, of 80, uh, 50% and an EBITDA to cash conversion uh, in excess of 80%. Thank you. Next slide. So I think uh, I've covered uh, the basis of what we've talked about here in terms of our advantage. We have a national network. We have that analytic and technology platform that we think is a critical point of difference. We have the operating model that we think stands alone in the industry as a point of difference. And then against all that, we have a customer-centric uh, culture within our business where the execution of our service promise to our customer takes second place only behind safety. We won't chase low cost revenue, low margin revenue, sorry. We don't compete for the Woolworths and the Bunnings and the Myers and the, and the, and the Kmarts of the world. Um, that is low margin, high volume work. That is not our business. The customers who value what we do seek exactly what I've spoken to. The breadth of service, the analytic capability, the variable cost, and the absolute focus on safety and service. If you bring that together, just before we come to the next slide, um, what that presents Silk, uh, and I'll talk to this later in the pack, but it gives us a multi-layered growth strategy. We have strategic M&A opportunities. We can accelerate customer penetration through our tech investment. We have opportunities to expand our geography and we have the opportunity to grab share of wallet from our existing customers. Um, we think that gives us a really unique position in the market and one that investors should be pleased to be part of given our current forecast revenue of 380 million, call it 400 million, um, is just over 1% of our addressable market, which is circa $32 billion. That's just in that port to door operation. So we think that's a really great proposition to, to have for a business. Thanks, Banjo. You'll have seen in the last week or so, we recently announced a New South Wales property uh, solution. Our thinking on this when we first went into, uh, into this property uh, project was really, how do we replace existing capacity with more purpose-built uh, and modern facilities? Noting that our facilities in New South Wales are only between five and 10 years old as we sit here today. Through the course of this project, we've been able to execute uh, an arrangement with ESR as our preferred party uh, for a 10 year lease that will position us with a really competitive uh, outcome from a rent and outgoing perspective in today's market, let alone in two years when this project comes to completion. Along the way, we've been able to participate uh, in an incentive scheme which will give us up to $28 million of incentive through a means of cash uh, and or rent uh, abatement and fit out costs. So we think this is a great deal for the business and our thinking has changed given that we have such a competitive footprint in what is an otherwise 
uh, particularly crowded real estate market, we've taken the view that we have two years to grow into these facilities and really stamp our presence in the New South Wales contract logistics market. What a great opportunity for the business. Thanks, Banjo. Next slide. One of the themes that recent conversations with investors has really focused on is our business model and what does you know, the, the inflation rate at 5.1 and rising interest rates mean for our business. Um, the business model we operate gives us wonderful protection. We have rise and fall mechanisms in our cost uh, arrangements with customers. Uh, and let's be frank, there's, there's never a fall, but that rise and fall mechanism allows us to recover in a structured and contracted way, the costs of doing business. So if our labor is rising at a rate that's higher than prior years, if our real estate costs are stepping up as they are at the moment, if fuel is stepping out as it has in recent months into you know, un unforeseen territory, we have the ability in our business model to recover those costs from our clients. There might be a lag, uh, depending on contract uh, rollover dates and the like, but we ultimately recover those cost increases on the way through as part of our contractual arrangements with our customers. And that's critical as you think about the uncertainty ahead of us with, with potentially a change of government, with some of the, the, the global sort of macro picture and what's going on in Europe and China. Um, so we need that certainty in our own business model to make sure that we can recover the costs. And certainly our current arrangements with customers protect us. So we've got a high growth business. We've got lots of opportunity in a, in a market where we're a small player. And we've got a business model that protects us from some of that uncertainty. We think that's a great asset. Probably my greatest challenge uh, as we sit here today, and this won't be new to you, but resources and people. And given the, uh, the, the immigration stalling for two years, um, a large portion of our frontline workforce has been over the years uh, fueled by that immigration rate. Added to that, logistics in the last two years has been incredibly tough. Um, and we've seen unprecedented rates of exit from the industry by staff who have just had enough. And the great resignation we've heard about from the US, but it's certainly playing out in Australia at the moment. Um, to give you some example, uh, our turnover rates are historically you know, 0.1, 0.2%. Our voluntary turnover rate in the first quarter of this year has been 3.1%, which is significant. So we're working hard on our employee value proposition uh, around wages, around conditions, and around other things that we think are important for them in terms, in, in terms of our learning and development programs and career opportunities to really try to create an environment in that hostile wage and, and labour market to attract people and be an employer of choice. From an opportunity perspective, the market is highly fragmented. In the port logistics environment, there's 883 carriers nationally across the five major ports. Um, the top three, ACFS, Cube and ourselves, uh, represent only a small portion of that 9 million containers. Uh, there is further opportunity to consolidate and aggregate in that part of the industry. In the warehousing and distribution space, there are also further opportunities to aggregate and consolidate. And clearly, whilst we have an outlook that continues an organic growth rate of 12 to 14%, we really see our merger and acquisition activity as a catalyst for further growth over and above those organic growth rates. Thanks, Banjo. I won't dwell on these because they'll be familiar to most of the audience. These are our half-year results. Suffice to say, we've released guidance recently um, that has us tra travelling uh, again in the second half very well. But perhaps some key highlights, strong cash, strong EBITDA to, to, uh, to cash conversion, uh, and volumetrics all signalling growth in our three service lines, 
of port logistics, warehousing and built consignments. What that looks like, thanks Banjo for the FY22 outlook, uh, is a revenue well ahead of our prospectus at 370 to 380 million, an underlying EBIT forecast between 25 and 26, again, well ahead of our prospectus, uh, and an impact of 16 million, which coming off the first half that still had a carryover of IPO costs will be a, a, a fantastic result for the full year. Our full year cash target of 21 uh, will see us pay down some of the debt that we took on for the New South Wales property uh, project. Uh, and that will be, a uh, again, a very strong cash result. In terms of uh, other activities, the business has continued to uh, focus on acquisitions. We've completed the 101 warehousing acquisition, which is in that e-commerce uh, space in February. We are active with a number of other conversations and uh, looking near term to complete at least one or two acquisitions. Uh, and then we will continue to uh, review and target strategic opportunities for acquisitions beyond that. We are at a point in terms of sweating our existing assets uh, where we're maximizing some of our capacity at the moment. Our warehousing operations are traveling at circa 90% utilization, which is on the higher side. So we are working with landlords in Melbourne, Perth and Brisbane uh, for additional capacity in those states over the medium term. Thanks, Banjo. In closing, um, I think what next for us as a business, uh, the operating markets, as I've described, are highly fragmented. We have a significant number of M&A opportunities. We continue to drive really strong organic growth. And I think our full year uh, new business revenues last year were 44 million. We are on track to outstrip that this year. So John and his team are doing a great job. Um, we sit here today as a business confident that the governance and the processes we've got in place will help us navigate some of those challenges externally. Uh, and with a view on the future, we think we've got no shortage of growth opportunities. I'll hand it over at that point to, uh, to some questions. Thanks a lot for the presentation today, Brennan. Um, I'll just jump straight into some questions. Uh, can you please comment on the challenges in China and how this may affect your business? Yeah, look, thank you. Um, we're, we're reasonably familiar, unfortunately, with uh, the challenges in China. I think it's fair to say at the moment, um, particularly in that uh, Shanghai port, which is a key player, um, around 30 to 40% of the normal container volume is still exiting that port and surrounding ports. Um, so there's certainly uh, in our near term, what we would consider a dip in activity. And that's probably still two to three weeks away from impacting our operations here. But as it has uh, last year, in that sort of uh, you know, July, August, September period, where we saw you know, container inbound volumes uh, really taking a plummet, um, what that simply means, uh, Banjo, is that the volume eventually arrives and it eventually comes with a rush. And I think that points to, again, our business model really suits that environment because we can turn off costs when we hit that you know, low period and ratchet resource back up, particularly in our contract, uh, sorry, our port operations um, as that volume arises. So what that means is we can protect our margins but be ready to service that volume when it does arrive. So it really is not volume that won't arrive, it's just a deferral uh, and then a very volatile uh, period of activity post. Perfect, thanks a lot. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, what percentage of your customers use Silk for all three of your offerings? Are you focused on getting existing company, uh, sorry, customers to use multiple offerings? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, there's two distinct parts to the business. The port logistics business, which is more transactional and has a long tail of customers, um, including a very uh, strong freight forwarding component to our revenue base. Um, our contract logistics, which is warehousing and distribution, um, 
is generally more longer term and contracted. And of that group, we have 88% of our warehouse customers using two or more services. So we're really pleased with our ability to penetrate our warehouse customers on that share of wallet focus. What we've identified as part of our recent uh, uh, round of strategic review, um, we think from port logistics back into the contract uh, and into distribution and then distribution coming back the other way, we think there's about 110 to 115 million opportunity in share of wallet activity for us still to gain. So we're, we've got to, John and the BT team very focused on you know, really uh, realising what we think is an easier sell than perhaps a new customer. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Just conscious of time, I'll ask one more question. Uh, what impacts are labour shortages, rising rates, petrol prices, et cetera, having on the business? And when do you see these normalising and what might that look like? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll deal with them each quickly. Uh, fuel, fuel's volatile. It will remain volatile, particularly with what's going on in Russia and other parts. Um, we have a mechanism that has been historically monthly to recover rising fuel costs and or reduce. Um, given the volatility in the last eight weeks, We've brought that back to a weekly uh, variable, and that's that's informed by industry bodies promoting a fuel surcharge. So we recover that on a weekly basis from our customers. Um, in terms of when that will write, who knows? Um, we just need to work our way through that. Uh, the second one, Banjo, was labour. Um, it is tight. Some of the bigger uh, players, Kmart, Coles, Woolworths, are offering forklift drivers $55 to $60 an hour, which is close to double industry rates and uh, two and a half times perhaps what the award might be. Um, we're hopeful uh, rising immigration will start to ease that burden. Uh, and indeed, we're looking at our own programs of promoting uh, offshore recruitment as a means to filling that gap within our own business. Uh, the third one was... Real uh, estate. Rising rates. Sorry? Rising rates. Interest rates? Yes. Look, not a direct impact for us. We have a very low debt profile, um, but probably the, the broader impact for us is the impact of that on some of our customer base, mindful that we're only a small player in that retail space. So barbecues galore and, and Caprice, for example, who serve a spotlight. Uh, that will obviously impact discretionary spend from a consumer perspective. So that might slow some demand in those categories of customers that we're dealing with. But our retail exposure is less than 20% of our overall revenue base. Brendan, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, unfortunately, that concludes our session with Silk today. Thanks for uh, giving us an update and all the best in the future. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot.